router trays. Router trays have been around for quite some time. Woodworkers have been making these for, for years and years. It's a great way to use some beautiful hardwoods to make a tray or a bowl. About a year ago, I made a video on how to make router bowls uh, without using templates. Just some basic tools, pretty fun project. If you're curious in the bowl style, uh, click on that card or check the link down in the description. But for this video, we're gonna look at using templates. So different styles of templates to make these router trays again just using a router and so for this video i'm going a full tutorial right all the steps all the different you know variations so be sure to use the timestamps down below to skip ahead if you don't need you know the info on glue ups and wood selection all that kind of thing feel free to skip around or or sit tight for the whole thing but uh router trays fun project fun build check it out so first up, I wanna talk about templates. So obviously you need to know the size of your template. So there are a lot of places online where you can purchase pre-made templates. So this is just MDF, it's about a half an inch, and it's already, you know, the perfect template sizes out for you. So links to the ones that I purchased down below, but there's a lot of others you can find online. You can also find some really cool ones on Etsy. Uh, with CNC machines, right, a lot more people are making their own templates. So whether you wanna purchase a pre-made template or find someone, you know, who has a CNC machine to make a really cool design for you can. So I went with you know a pretty reputable company uh, that makes these this football one this cool little dish and so they come like this right and you can just use I'll show you how you can just use it as is I'm also going to show you how you can you know make duplicates of it just in case you have some issues uh, so there'll be some steps on that process it also helps as you get the smaller profile you can minimize uh, your waste of wood so you can really kind of get a narrower piece uh, to make sure it fits just so so you don't have too much extra and then also just really quick how you can make a basic one like a square bowl uh, really simple uh, you can make your own so you you don't need a CNC machine to make this, but here are some template ideas and how to use the templates. First off, you can see how I made my own or a smaller version of the templates I purchased and why it's so advantageous. I can really see where it's gonna be laid out on my wood blank and I can maximize the wood. So how to make your own duplicates and all of that is right here, the steps. So you take whatever you purchase, just get some scrap MDF and then just trace it out on the MDF. Just using half inch MDF here. And then you just wanna remove most of the material, not all of it, because you're gonna to need to use that flush trim bit later. Uh, so using a hole saw, then using this jigsaw, just drilling it out. Uh, you can see I'm well within the line. I don't wanna to be too close to the line. Uh, it's kind of like that happy medium in between. And then I'm gonna attach my template to the MDF. I'm just using screws here. That's perfectly fine. You could use double stick tape. And then with the flush trim router bit, I can go ahead and go to the router table and I can get a perfect match. And then there you can see it. Uh, it does make a lot of dust with the MDF, so make sure you're wearing a respirator. But uh, a good flush trim bit, uh, a router table really does help. But here I've made a perfect duplicate of the one I purchased. To get the exterior uh, dimensions, I'm just using some dividers, some other you know drawing tools here to get the curves just right. As far as the wall thickness, it's really whatever you decide. You know, here it's about three quarters of an inch for me, uh, but it's just kind of the look that I was going for. But you want to go ahead and trim that to size. So I could use a bandsaw like here because this is MDF and it's so thin. You could easily use a jigsaw if you don't have a bandsaw. Uh, but this really did come in handy for me uh, to maximize the wood, but also if you have any issues later, uh, you have a second copy. You do wanna make sure that your, your template is really clean, right? So using a sander, making sure it's exactly how you want it. Uh, same thing here with this little uh, self-made square, uh, squared template uh, for the bowls. You wanna make sure that that, especially the interior where the, the dish is gonna be, it's perfect because that is gonna be replicated with the router tray. All right, so here I am going ahead and laying out the lines on a piece of wood. It's really nice, especially if you're doing like kind of these two-tone look bowls, uh, to save some of that interior material. So the same process I use for making the templates, I'm applying to this top piece of really nice uh, black walnut. It's got some figuring. This wood would be wasted uh, if I had just you know gone straight into the process. And so uh, using this approach, I can save some of that wood 
And there I've removed some of that material. You can see it's well within the margins of my template uh, when I come back with that final bit. Uh, and so I've saved some wood, right? So you got that walnut on the cherry. It's a great look, but I do recommend doing this to, to save wood uh, so it's not all sawdust and wood chips. Just using some Type Bond 3 here. I like Type Bond 3. It has a little bit more open time, but it is also water resistant. Uh, so that's going to help for uh, bowls that get washed and, and whatnot. But go ahead and clamp it on down and uh, you're good to go. So this same process, right, you can do it over and over again, especially if you're doing those, um, you know, face grain glue ups, those multiple layers. This is just a great way to conserve uh, some of that wood in, in the middle. And especially as you can see here, you know, it's got some figure, got some nice wood here uh, that would be all wasted otherwise. So pretty straightforward process. It's repetitive, but you get the idea. And there you have it. You can see some of the wood that is saved, uh, what it looks like. This is just a great option. Now, if you wanted to save even more wood, you could make the top uh, portion even thicker and the bottom portion thinner. There's other ways around this, but this is a quick solution uh, to save wood. As far as the multiple species laminated, you know, edge grain cutting board style, I'm not going to do that here in this video. Uh, if you want to see how to do a cutting board glue up for those really thick blanks, you can watch my cutting board 101 video. You can tap that card or the link down in the description. Lots of great tips on how to get a great glue up uh, for cutting boards and all the different things you need here. Uh, of course, you might want to make wider stock uh, like you saw earlier uh, for those top pieces. So you can do a face grain glue up. But back to uh, where I'm tracing out the templates. All right, so I got the template, I got my wood blanks, time to go. So I'm tracing it to size, getting everything right where I want it, marking it out, and now I need to hog out the material. I need to get out the material in the middle. All right, so once you have all of your blanks created, whether it's a solid species, a two layer piece, or one of these edge grain pieces, you want to trace out your outline uh, for the template. So on this one, you can see the, the pencil marks there. So I have a feel for where it's going to be. Or with this example where I saved some of the material, but I still have the pencil marks to know what the eventual shape is going to be. I don't want to do the whole project with just one router bit. So this is the primary router bit that we'll be using. Uh, it's got a bearing. Uh, it's rounded. It's a bowl and tray router bit. All of the, the tools and bits, links down below if you're interested. However, that's a lot of strain on one router bit, especially on thicker pieces like this one, or even a little bit less thick like this. And so a common practice for making bowl and trays uh, is to hog out the material at a drill press. And so you mark the lines, go to the drill press and get most of the material, leaving some space just to prevent strain on the bit. You could also use a straight bit. You could use a spiral upcut bit like this other options, uh, but it, it is a recommendation. Don't just use the router bit or it's not going to last you very long. So options, but let's go to the drill press and hog out some of that material. So at the drill press, you want to set your depth stop. Now with these Forstner bits, there is that extra point on the bottom. So you don't want to go all the way down to the bottom because you're going to be doing some finishing passes with the bit later. So you want to give yourself a little bit of room uh, when you set that depth stop. Uh, here, I'm using a pretty good bench top uh, drill press and it looks like it's really chewing through that material in no time and it does a great job. But really any drill press, it is going to take some time. Good, clean, sharp bit. More powerful drill presses will obviously do better. Uh, but drill presses are a great option for quickly removing that material. Uh, again, if you don't have a powerful drill press or something like this, there are those other options. Uh, maybe just using a, a straight bit or a spiral upcut bit, uh, kind of like I did in my router bowl video. Uh, you can check that video as well. But uh, here, the same process for the one that I already removed some of that material. I still want to remove uh, most of it here at the drill press so it's not all on that router bowl bit. Can see it's still messy but I, I was able to remove a lot of stuff now this is a lot of wood chips and this makes everyone cringe and i get that but this is the same process as bull turning uh, it's going to happen and you can repurpose the chips in some way but there's other ways around that so here's that bit again it's a bowl and tray bit it's got the rounded corners it's got a nice bearing on the side and i am using this collet extender i really recommend the collet extender for those deep reach the deep reach on bowls uh, for cleaning up the bottom 
you're gonna need to have a special plate, a bigger, wider plate that's gonna be safer. Uh, I got all of this, the tips on how I made this in that router bowl video. It's just pretty straightforward. It's acrylic. Links to all this stuff is down below. Um, you know, some people do recommend using the router table to remove the bottom. I just think that's terrifying. So I do recommend using the router uh, you know, with a plunge router like this. Now here I'm attaching the template. I love using blue uh, painter's tape and then just some CA glue, some Starbond CA glue and activator. It's got such a great hold. You can use double stick tape. I just prefer using the, the CA glue. And you want to clamp it down. And here I am just taking shallow passes, just a little bit at a time. And that bearing is riding along the template. Then it's going down the wall of, of the tray. And I'm working my way down. Now on some woods like maple, you can see there's some burn marks marks that are showing up there. You do want to make sure that you don't slow down. You want to keep moving, make sure you have a clean bit, a sharp bit. Uh, if you go too slow, that's where you get the burning, like with juice grooves and cutting boards on cherry and, and maple, some of those lighter color woods. Uh, but once you've gone through and you've cleaned up the bottom, uh, just go ahead and remove it and it's actually pretty clean. It looks really nice, really clean. We'll clean everything up at the end with sanding. Uh, but again, you want to make sure you know where you're at. So here's your process. You got template, you got blank, trace it out, hog out the material, and then you clean it up with that router bit. So with that bowl and tray bit, again, you want to set your depth stops. So I recommend about half an inch from the bottom, uh, whatever you want to do, but just don't go too deep. Don't go too far. Make sure you set that depth stop. You got enough material. You want a deep dish, a shallow dish, but make sure you set that depth stop and you're aware of that. Don't go too deep. Uh, clamping is huge. I love using my armor tool workstation here with these inline clamps. It doesn't really go anywhere. I can also wheel this cart out outside and make all the sawdust. It's just easier than doing any kind of attachments for dust collection. Uh, but another option is just screwing the template to the wood itself if you don't want to use double stick tape. If you have wide enough wood, you can do that. And that is obviously super secure and that works really well. But if you're trying to conserve material, uh, that blue tape and uh, CA glue really works great. And that's what I do for most of my uh, pieces like this. So clamp it down, keep you know doing those shallow passes, set your depth stop, and it really, it cleans up the bottom very nicely. You get the edges just so, and there you have it. So here is a, just a small batch of uh, different trays, different styles for you to see, and it get, got really clean, awesome. So the same process like I did earlier using these dividers and different layout tools to get the measurements uh, for my exterior, you can do the same thing on your finished piece. So if you ended up not making your own that has that template already, you can just do the same process on your finished piece to kind of mark out your lines uh, for the outside. Now you could use a jigsaw. However, most of these are thick. It's hard stuff. That's gonna be pretty tricky to do a jigsaw. So I really do recommend a bandsaw. Uh, I just have a smaller 10 inch unit here. And really the bandsaw is such a great method. Uh, this is sped up so it looks like I'm going super fast, but you know, it's just the little bandsaw that could. So I really recommend using a bandsaw or finding someone with a bandsaw. You'll make quicker work of this, but you don't have to have a bandsaw. So for those of you who don't have one, here's a, a weird option, but I wanted to give you a different option. So I have a quarter inch upcut spiral bit just as a router bit and I'm freehanding this. So I just have a smaller little trim router. I have a little template, a little base plate like I did on, on the other process. This just gives me a little bit more control. And what I'm doing is I just went down about half an inch, three eighths of an inch, uh, just to get kind of that top line. Now I'm gonna remo remove most of the extra material up to that line. I'm using some micro jib, micro jig, match fit clamps and a little sled just to safely remove most of that material because I'm gonna use a flush trim bit. And so a flush cut bit is gonna work great, but I wanna remove most of that material so I can get up to that line. So you can see how I have most of that material removed. You know, I went back with the miter saw and I got a little bit closer to that line. And then I'm gonna use a big two inch cutting length uh, router bit. This is a beast of a bit. So you really wanna make sure you are close to that line and then you go to the router table. Uh, this is a method if you don't have the bandsaw. Uh, just be super careful with it. You don't wanna overstrain the bit. You don't want a bit to snap on you. This is a good solid bit. I had no issues with it. But like with any flush trim work, you do need to make sure that you're not removing too much material. Uh, so, you know, using that initial cut and then you got it, right? And so it actually worked out really well. Didn't use the bandsaw, 
I do recommend the bandsaw though. That's the best method. So uh, here it's just, you know, you make quick work, kind of trace it out uh, at the bandsaw and you can get really good results that way. But there are other options. So no one has to be like, well, I don't have all the tools. You can, you can do it without the tools, but okay. Bandsaw works great. All right, message received. Uh, then you're gonna clean it up. So cleaning it up with a sander, a benchtop unit works great. Probably wanna clamp that sucker down so it's not skating around the table for you. But uh, this is a really important step. And with just, you know, you could do this with a hand sander, with a random orbital sander. Uh, just having a disc sander or a belt sander like this, it, it makes quicker work just to clean it up, especially if you used a jigsaw or it wasn't as clean. Another option is just to do a heavy chamfer. And so set your table saw at 45 degrees and then just go ahead and like cut up a 45 degree angle to make it look like a really deep chamfer, make a more modern look. And so not that perfect, you know, profile of the dish. So that's another option that you can do uh, if you don't have the, if you don't have all those tools, right? That actually looked really good here on this uh, square bowl uh, where I did that on both sides and I think it turned out rather nicely. And so uh, yet another option for you for rem removing that material. But again, clean up those edges. Uh, this oscillating belt sander at 45 worked rather nicely. Just make quick work. There's gonna be a lot of sanding. Just, just embrace the sanding. But this is my favorite step. Like honestly, adding this round over just changes the bowls and trays dramatically. And so a big, big router bit like this works really well. You could do a chamfer or you know a more you know discreet, minute uh, <laughs> round over, uh, subtle, subtle round over. But uh, this step is really fun uh, to add that big round over on the outside. You can de decide if you wanna do it on the top and bottom, uh, as well as your interior interior round over. Um, you could use a trim router like this and just go on the inside. That is certainly an option if you don't have a router table. I just made, you know, that's a $30 router table and works great. You could clamp it in a bench vise. This is a little sketch sometimes, uh, but we sometimes do sketch things. So uh, I would recommend either just doing the handheld uh, action like I switched over to here or just using a bench top unit. But here you go. Inevitably, you're gonna have some issues with the router work. You're gonna have some protrusions. Maybe you went too deep somewhere and you're gonna to have to do some sanding. So there's a lot of different sanding attachments. Uh, this is actually a pneumatic sander, small profile, two inches. It can really get in there. Uh, the pneumatic option, you know, sometimes you need a bigger air compressor, uh, but you're gonna to have to do a fair amount of sanding. So I actually went through a lot of different sanding attachments and I have a whole separate video on that. Uh, but the pneumatic sander was a fun one. This is one that I use all the time. It's the ArborTech contour sander. This is by far my favorite. It just attaches to an angle grinder and it cleans up the edges so well and it really helps in the bottom just getting superior results. But if you want to see these attachments at greater length and more attachments, go ahead and check this video. It's a whole other video. It's pretty short just going through all of these different attachments and some ideas uh, just to minimize your hand sanding. But um, you're gonna wanna do this. This one right here, this can be done in a handheld drill, but at the drill press, this is my favorite, this little drum attachment. It's like, you know, 15, 20 bucks for these. And this really, really speeds up uh, the interior sanding. You could do this all by hand, uh, but if you're doing a big batch, I really recommend these attachments at the uh, drill press. It's great. But again, you can do this by hand as well. Using a random orbital sander is, is a must and you can get great uh, great results just with that random orbital. So uh, for me, I like to start at 80 grit and I just clean up everything. Even though I use bench top units, I'm still gonna go back and use the random orbital just to get my final shaping, remove tooling marks as best as possible, uh, add some CA glue uh, for some voids and activator, uh, but go ahead and, and sand away. Here's that contour sander again. I really love using this. For me, when I sand, I usually do 80 grit, then I do 120 and then 150. And then at 150, I'll raise the grain. Sometimes I'll do 180 as well. Uh, it just depends on, on the piece and what I'm doing. But go ahead and sand. You are gonna do some hand sanding. And so when it comes to hand sanding, I really like to do the hand sanding. You know, for instance, if I'm hand sanding at 120, I hand sand at 120 and then I use a powder sander at 120. And doing the hand sanding before uh, that same grit with the power is gonna remove tool marks. So it's a great step. Sanding. Lots of sanding. This is just some of the sandpaper. 
uh, but you get a feel for it. Like I said earlier, you're gonna need to raise the grain. So because this is gonna get washed, these bowls and trays might get washed or come in contact with water, what I'm doing is I'm just lightly misting them like I would with a cutting board, and this is gonna raise the wood fibers. And then I'll let it dry, and then I can sand down those wood fibers. Otherwise, when this bowl got washed or the tray got water on it, uh, it would be all rough to the touch. So what I do is about 150, once I'm at 150 grit, then I, I spray it, let it dry, and then I sand it at 220 and continue. All right, so you got them all sanded, time for finish. Plenty of options. Ultimately, it's, it's what you're going for in the product. What are you envisioning it being used? If it's gonna come in contact with food, you do wanna make it food safe. Now, technically, almost every finish when it's fully cured is food safe. However, you're planning to sell it, liability, all of that, you, you might wanna pick something that is you know, all safe for consumption, all that kind of stuff, food grade uh, products. So you can do, you know, your film finishes, you can do all that. In my router bowl video, I did cutting board oil and wood wax uh, by Walrus Oil. It was a great finish, turned out really great. Uh, I love that, that's what I use for most of my cutting boards. Walrus Oil's got a, a bunch of other really great products, easy to apply, super, super quick. Today, I'm gonna to be using tried and true original finish. I actually got this for that router bowl video, uh, but this has a little bit more steps involved, but it, it provides a little bit more protection. It's fully food safe, great product, heard a lot of great things. So uh, this is me applying uh, tried and true and going through all the steps. If you don't care about this particular product, skip ahead to see those beauty shots uh, and final tips. But tried and true, how to apply it. With this particular finish, and with actually a lot of finishes, it's a good idea to use maybe 4 aught steel wool or these synthetic steel wools, uh, just to go ahead and remove any, any other fuzzies, any other uh, fibers, just get it nice and burnished. Uh, this particular one, tried and true, they do recommend burnishing ahead of time. So you can use the steel wool. I just prefer these synthetic steel wool pads, like Scotch-Brite pads. You're not gonna get all those metal flakes and metal dust. And I'm just going ahead and I'm just making everything smooth to the touch, right? So clean it all up, get it all nice and smooth, using some tack cloth here to remove most of the dust and the wood fibers. And then it's time to apply this beautiful finish. So it's pretty straightforward. I'm using those same Scotch-Brite pads to apply any kind of applicator. And now you get that color transformation, that beautiful walnut, the cherry. Uh, and it just, it's a light coat. You just wanna apply a really light coat uh, to these woods. Uh, if you're curious about the woods I used and wanna learn more about wood, I do have a whole video, Wood 101, that talks about all the different woods, where to find them, where do you buy them, all that kind of stuff. But uh, with this finish, you add a light coat, just a nice light coat and it's a little bit more work than just mineral oil. Uh, but the great thing about this, uh, mineral oil can take like 30 days to cure and those oils, it'll just keep, you know, it won't dry out for a while. Uh, whereas this, it's gonna cure in 24 hours. Uh, you're gonna have to do a couple coats, but it really, it is a great finish. And so I'm um, just applying that light first coat on all of the wood. Uh, once all of the wood has gotten that first coat, I need to let it sit out. I'm gonna let it sit for about an hour, uh, let it saturate. So here it is just sitting. It's got its first coat, about an hour. Wait an hour, uh, it's kind of like the hard waxes, right? It's got that beeswax, and then you wanna buff it in. So using some clean Scotch-Brite uh, applicators or, or other cloths that you might have, you wanna buff in all of that, remove the excess. You don't want anything to stand on there. Uh, this orbital buffer is awesome. I love it. I've used this for cutting boards all the time. It's about you know $25 unit. Great unit, you can do it by hand, you can do it by hand. Uh, but you wanna buff it all in, and then you have your first coat. So it needs to sit for about 24 hours. After 24 hours, it's fully cured, and now it's time, uh, then you can do a second coat, a third coat. Uh, with my cutting boards, after my first coat of finish, I usually like to sand it at 320, and so I did the same thing here. Uh, sometimes uh, this finish they recommend to burnish after the 24 hour cure. So I went ahead and sanded everything at 320 and 400. Just I want it extra smooth, uh, but you could burnish it with the steel wool or the synthetic wool. Then you apply a second coat. So second coat, light. Um, they do recommend two coats, two or three. I, I went with two and it was great, uh, but it's again, however much you want 
to go. Uh, but again, buffing it in, burnishing. There's some really cool uh, extra tools that I found, uh, attachments to really help with the buffing and burnishing. So check them out. So every time I do one of these new batches, and, and most of my videos, I try and use some new products just to kind of test out, let you know. So with these, uh, at this point, you really do want to make sure that you buff it in, or like with this finish, it's called burnishing, right? And so I got a couple different units. So you have all of these, this is a kit, all of this stuff links down below. Just a bunch of different attachments you can use with a handheld drill, or you can use the drill press, uh, just to kind of get that buffing in into the, the recesses, uh, working really well. So I'll show you how I did that. Works really well, spoiler alert. Also, got this little one. Uh, these are all one inch, and this actually is super thin, so this would work for a rotary tool, or it would work with a hand drill. But you got all your different little one inch grits. Uh, it also comes like with this little, I don't know, like little Velcro peel and things, so you can kind of get in there a little bit better for hand sanding. So if you want to go crazy and go up to, you know, 2,000 grit, it's got all those small 5,000 grit, get a super, super uh, smooth finish, that's an option. So two different options, some more things to, to consider if you're really looking to elevate uh, the feel and overall performance of your project. So some real quick buffing and burnishing tips here. So here it is, right? These work amazing at the drill, at the drill press. Obviously, it's great. Uh, I'm controlling the workpiece. Uh, different, different sizes, different attachments, but it really got great results really quickly and uh, just better than just using my hands and it saved me, especially on a bigger batch like this, uh, really came in clutch. Uh, but you, of course, can do this with a drill. Uh, a handheld unit actually worked really well. The handheld unit worked surprisingly well. It's gonna, you know, throw off some of those cotton pieces there. Uh, but this is a small kit, you know, 20 bucks or so. It really helps uh, with efficiency. That other one, this really would work well with a, a rotary tool like a Dremel and all those different grits. So if you're gonna go crazy and get up into the thousands and get like a mirror-like finish, it's really great. That little little pad, it's got a bonnet. Uh, another option for you just uh, to test it out. But the results were great. So this is a fun batch. This batch turned out really nicely. You can keep adding more and more finish. This is just two coats. Uh, you can add more wax if you want more of a, a sheen uh, to it. Obviously, the more you burnish it, uh, the more shiny it's gonna get, but it's, it's totally up to what you want. But uh, beautiful wood, beautiful router trays. Well, there you have it, how to make a router tray. If you enjoyed this video and you found value, please consider subscribing down below, notifications, all that jazz. Uh, all of the links uh, to the tools, accessories that I used are down below, as well as some other videos like Wood 101, kind of talking about different wood selection and, and wood types. Typically on our channel, right, it's, it's using beautiful hardwoods and giving you a tutorial on, on how to make projects like this. Uh, coming up, we do have some exciting new things using a CNC. I know some are no, no a CNC. It's kind of the whole point of this video is not using one. However, there are some really cool possibilities with it. So just going to show some of that but of course more typical uh, traditional woodworking i personally feel there's room for both uh, but some good projects and fun projects ahead thanks for stopping by and uh, we'll catch you next time take care